I guess just starting off, uh, why do you feel like you're the most qualified candidate for governor? Well, I think uh, my time in military service is really what equipped me the most to be the senior most executive leader of Illinois, where we uh, focus on a mission and uh, really not what sets us apart as, as human beings. And uh, we have such a diverse group of men and women that come into the military from all backgrounds. And I, I think that it, it's that diversity and having the ability to lead people uh, like I did at Recruit Training Command right here in, uh, in Illinois up at Great Lakes Naval Station. And uh, just seeing that, look, uh, leadership at its foundation is about working with people um, from diverse backgrounds. And successful leaders have the ability to adapt their leadership styles based upon um, you know, other, other individuals and, and their backgrounds and what their talents and their resources are, where they come from, and be, being able to capitalize on all of that. And these are skills that I learned after 20 years of military service, and I feel that it's readily equipped me uh, to be the governor. Now, when you talk about your 20 years of military service, and uh, its relation to the office of governor. I mean, what did you actually do during your time as military and, and how do you feel like that best serves uh, you to become the, the next governor of the state? Well, I, I had a very um, diverse background. I did a lot of different things actually. I was a um, machinist mate on board submarines and so I was entrusted with national security, uh, very thoroughly vetted by the United States as being somebody who's trustworthy. And to this day, I continue to maintain national secrets uh, as I should. And so I, I think that that's one important aspect that uh, I've been deemed to be trustworthy and uh, was privileged enough to handle very classified information with a top secret clearance. And I think that that's one aspect that uh, gives voters, you know, the, the, the warm fuzzy of, hey, we can trust this guy in what he says. Uh, secondly, is the dedication required to that job. You don't get paid a lot and you deploy uh, substantially. I spent probably, oh, right about six years of my life under the ocean. So that's, that's not including, you know, 100-hour work weeks as a recruit division commander up at Great Lakes. And so I'm very dedicated to my job and in, in serving people. And that's always something that I've had a heart for is, is servitude and, and helping others. And I found that, uh, that home in the military. But once that career was over, well, I wanted to look elsewhere. And uh, before we get into you know, the specific policy issues, uh, what is the one thing that you would be able to do as governor that no other candidate would be able to do? Well, I, I think having the ability to work across party lines, not being a Republican or a Democrat. Being libertarian, we're what we consider to be socially compassionate and fiscally responsible. And so where that benefits the state is not having that hyper-partisanship in the executive office and having somebody that can reach across both sides of the aisle and find common ground. And I think that that's something that we've really been lacking, um, in, in, not only in the governor's office, but just in the General Assembly. And I, I think that having a libertarian there is going to give us a unique position that we've never enjoyed before, where again, um, I mean, I work with legislators like Representative LaShawn Ford out of Chicago on shared parenting legislation. I was recently endorsed by Alan Skillicorn, a, um, a sitting House Republican right now. And uh, I was recently endorsed by Black Lives Matter of Lake County. And so where else do you see that where you have a candidate running that's finding endorsement and support from two totally opposite sides of the spectrum? Now, this, uh Maybe a relatively easy question, but you talk about being the third party option. Um, what makes you different than Sam McCann? Well, Sam McCann, if you ask him, and these, this, these were words right out of his mouth in one of the interviews that I did with him in Chicago, um, was that, what's his platform? Well, he cuts and pastes the Republican platform right over to the conservative party. And again, I, I think in doing so, that alienates a whole other side of people not to mention moderates and independents that don't necessarily align with the Republican platform or the Democratic platform. They find themselves in the middle. And I think that that's where the majority of us are at. We're, we're just pragmatic. We're okay with, uh, with government. We, we don't mind, but we want it smaller. We want limited government. And we also want to be able to live our lives the way that we want to, not how a particular party uh, wants to dictate to the rest of society. And I, I think, again, that is the, one of the largest things that sets me apart from all of the other candidates 
and uh, it, it's something that we've never truly enjoyed. Um, now, in regards to that, uh, the whole, you know, McCann essentially aligning himself with conservative Republicans, um, I don't know if you saw the new ad he put out today. I just saw it pop up on, on CapFax not too long ago, but uh, it's essentially what you're talking about as far as him trying to align himself with President Trump and that base of voters. Um, now, if you were to be elected governor, obviously you would have to work with President Trump uh, for at least two years, possibly, possibly longer than that. Uh, how do you feel you would be able to actually do such a thing? Well, I, I, I would really attribute it back to, my, again, my military service in that, look, I served under several different presidents and we don't, again, we don't focus on political uh, differences. We focus on mission and what's the mission? The mission is, is progressing our state as well as our nation forward in a positive way. And whatever way I can do that to work with whoever that president might be, I mean, it could be Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump. I'm indifferent on who's sitting in the office. It's my job to put aside my personal differences that I may have with them and uh, hold them to uh, the letter of the United States Constitution that whatever they're doing, um, it, it should be constitutional, number one. And where they kind of overstep and well, let's just say there's, you know, they speak out about a particular issue, throw, you can throw anything out there, um, and I don't necessarily agree. I have my voice to voice my disagreement, but that doesn't mean I won't continue to work alongside to do what's best for, for the state of Illinois um, as well as this country. Um, now, as far as the actual issues in Illinois, um, you know, obviously running as a libertarian, uh, what do you feel like is the biggest issue facing Illinois? Well, it's really both tied into one another. Uh, property taxes and unfunded pensions, I believe, are, are the two largest issues that really you could say are just one issue in being uh, fiscally related. and. Um, What's driving people out of the state are the net loss that we're having in population, I believe is primarily due to high property taxes. Uh, and that's just through the conversations that I'm having with people all across this state and their inability to afford just the continued raising of taxes and being taxed out of their home. Uh, I live up in Lake County. We have, I believe, uh, the last time that I had looked, we were the 17th highest uh, in the nation. And I think the best solution to that um, and the most moral solution to that is to cap property taxes. It, uh, I would like to see it done at 1% of the purchase price of the home. So if you purchase a home for $200,000, then for the life of that home, you'll never pay more than $2,000 in property tax, unless by a two-third voter referendum, the citizens agree to raise property taxes. And I believe that that's a method to restore trust to the people where right now they don't trust their local legislators. They know that they have been uh, doling out additional benefits, um, uh, pension perks, salary perks, whatever. And they don't trust uh, in many communities their local officials. And so I want to help them to rein that in. And I think that a two third voter referendum uh, statewide where uh, let, let's just say in, um, you know, in, in Carbondale, if they wanted to raise property taxes, well then in, in that taxing district, they need to get two-third voter approval, 66%. I think that that's fair. And I think that that's a way to begin to restore trust back to our local officials while holding them accountable. Um, and you talk about a 1% cap. I was reading some other stuff, talked about a 5% property tax freeze. Is that at all. Not a 5%, it was a five year. Or five year, sorry, yeah, yeah. I, I misread my Five year property one. tax free. So uh, my policy team and I have been kind of um, hashing that one out back and forth. Which one is the best um, one to go through? And as I've uh, traveled the state more and the, the five year property tax freeze was something that I advocated very early on and kind of stuck next to. But the more I traveled and the more I talked with people, um, the less that they, they they weren't so much concerned with the five-year property tax freeze as they were a much longer term of, look, I want to remain here. I want my roots to stay here. And five years really didn't give them enough comfort. So I kind of went back to the drawing board with the policy team and said, hey, let's, let's take a harder look at this because 
people, they think that that's a good you know, first step, but they they're not comfortable staying here long term and they're looking for long term planning, of course. And that 1% property tax has been much more um, uh, palatable and receptive to the voters that I've spoken with. Are you concerned at all that placing such a cap on property taxes could hinder uh, districts like school boards, the largest driver of, of property taxes for the most part, and, uh, and other local governments that it could uh, create possible financial emergencies in their cases if they're not, not able to actually uh, go to the voters and get the property tax increases that, that they might need? Well, I believe that it's definitely going to force some very difficult conversations that aren't being had right now. And I believe that that's something that we need to do. Look, we've got over 860 school districts uh, statewide. And I believe that with a consolidation of administration, I'm not talking brick and mortar here, because um, I know this is really important, especially to uh, more rural communities where they have significant distances that they must bus their children already. So what I'm talking about is the administrative overhead. And if we take a look at, at states like Florida that have um, far more population, yet they have far uh, fewer school districts. Now, how is it that a state that has a much larger population than us can serve more people with less government? They're saving their taxpayers a lot of money by doing so. That additional administration, the six-figure salary, seven-figure pensions, premium health care benefits, all of that adds up. And I would rather see those resources going to hire additional teachers and or um, fund better uh, or uh, expand programs for students. Um, Got to try to rifle through a few of these other issues. Um, now you'd also talked about pensions being an issue. Uh, it's kind of intertwined with property taxes, but how do you, I mean, obviously it's a, you know, a, what, a, a nine figure pension deficit at this point. Uh, how do you deal with that? <laughs> Uh, it, it's, it's a mountain and it's going to have to be transitional. Uh, it, we're going to have to do it in increments. And I think the best step that the General Assembly could take right now, and it's something that I believe was done about a year ago, and that's to open up the same system that the state university employees have had in the state university retirement system. They've had it for over 20 years. They have the ability to opt in, not be mandated, but opt into a 401k style system. And I think that that might be very attractive to more tier two employees. I wouldn't expect tier one employees to opt into that, but I believe that those not yet vested, um, it would be attractive to them. Because whenever I talk with teachers and people working um, in our prison systems and police officers and firefighters, a lot of them understand while it's constitutional, it's written in black and white, if the money's not there at the end of the day, they're not going to get paid. They're not going to get what we promised them. And we need to honor, number one, our constitutional obligation to all current and previous employees, but we must also change course. And if the Department of Defense, the federal government, is already moving to blended style systems and away from defined benefit plans, we're behind the federal government. That's a problem. If the, if the federal government is doing things more um, uh, rapidly than what we are as a state, we are behind the power curve, and it's time that we transition to a 403B or 401K style system. How do you get that plan passed, Mike Madigan? I think the best way to do that is to uh, flip at least nine, 10 or more um, seats in the House. That's how we're going to have to do that. Look, we've got over 40% of seats going unopposed from election cycle to election cycle. So policy makers aren't being challenged on their voting record. Uh, and that's why we continue to have incumbents that oftentimes I don't believe um, are either qualified to do the job or they're serving their own interest. And we need to challenge that. I think the best way to challenge that is the Libertarian Party becoming an established party in this election cycle. And in 2020, us recruiting and uh, running people for offices in these districts that are going unchallenged. They go unchallenged because of the gerrymandering. Republicans know they, they can't run candidates in Democrat strongholds and vice versa. They don't, they don't even waste the money. And so we need to challenge more of these legislators and make them defend their positions and give voters more options. We need that. 
How do you do that with uh, the resources that the Libertarian Party currently has? Because, I mean, what you're talking about is pretty much what Bruce Rauner is already trying to do with Republicans and hasn't it exactly worked. I mean, it's gotten his super, the Democrat supermajority kind of, you know, out of, the, out of the water, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they still don't have a stronghold. Certainly, uh, and, and they still do have a stronghold. I would completely agree with that. And look, we're not looking to uh, here in the next, you know, uh, five years to replace, if you will, the Republican Party. Um, what we're looking to do is to give voters more options for fiscally minded people. That is the greatest issue that the entire state shares is not having people that are fiscally responsible. Conservative is a terrible word to use because a lot of Republicans are anything but fiscally conservative. Libertarians are fiscally responsible and with the same ballot access as Republicans or Democrats, we can at least challenge in these districts and force Democrats to defend more positions. Um, one issue that I, I, I definitely wanted to bring up before we get out, um, parents' rights has been obviously a, a thing that's come up a lot with, with, uh, with your campaign why do you feel like that's a worthwhile cause? Well, um, can I flip a question you know, back to you? Do you think that you, or I don't know if you have any children or not, but let's just say any parent out there, do you believe that a parent should be stripped of their time with their children simply because they go through a custody proceeding if they've never been found to be unfit? That's what the Supreme Court had decided in Troxel versus Granville, is that we ha there is a presumption that is a fit parent that you will make the best decisions for your child. And what's happening is, is the state is making decisions for our children when it should be the parents. Family rights is a huge issue that is going undiscussed and it's contributing to the 20 million American children growing up absent a biological parent. It's contributing significantly. And I'll tell you this, I have not went to one location in this state and didn't have people come out simply because of where I stand on reforming family law. It is a very important issue. Nobody else is talking about it. And I think in large part, it's due to uh, the significant amount of finances that flows from the Illinois Bar Association to legislators' campaigns. That's a significant problem. And look, uh, that is a special interest group protecting its members and not protecting our children. We need to have a rebuttable presumption of 50-50 shared parenting, equal shared parenting. That should be the starting point. Judges would still enjoy the 17 criteria they utilize right now. That wouldn't go away in making custody determinations. And we need to re completely reform our child support laws. They're archaic and the way that they treat people they actually treat um, good parents as though they're criminals. And that's something I want to see ended. How do you respond to voters that might have reservations about you because of some of the stuff that's come out in regards to your own case with, with your ex-wife, uh, some of the allegations of spousal abuse and, and delinquent child support? Uh, how do you address those concerns with voters? Well, they're legitimate concerns. And it's really what drove me into running for office. I mean, if I could have 20 years in the military, uh, hold a top secret clearance, be a reserve sheriff's deputy in the very county where I've gotten mistreated, um, and that can happen to somebody like myself, then what does it do to the average person who doesn't have the same background that I have? Uh, and that's something that we have to question. We saw this in the Brett uh, Kavanaugh proceedings where accusations were made, no proof was ever rendered, and yet he was basically being adjudicated by the public and I've experienced something similar. While not to the high profile of what his has been, mine has been very similar, and I understand that. And they should have questions, but I want them to answer, I want those questions to be answered. The allegations made against me, number one, were false. I was never charged with any crimes at all, much less convicted of anything, uh, which is why I challenged our state's attorney on these practices that I believe they're unconstitutional because they strip people of, of multiple rights. When these allegations are made and an order of protection is issued, they immediately strip you of your Second Amendment right. It, in effect, takes an immediate uh, seizure of your home and your family, where you have no contact with your family, you can't go to your home, and you can't possess firearms. Yet, no due process was ever rendered, but it's done instantaneously. 
And I believe that it's due to the federal incentives that the state receives that they'll continue uh, these policies and practices until we challenge and change that. Regarding the child support, I have always, always supported my children. I've paid over $100,000 in child support. Now, would a deadbeat parent pay over $100,000 in child support and an additional $50,000 in court costs fighting for more time, fighting to be in the lives of their children? No, they wouldn't. And oftentimes, sadly, people don't have the same resources that I had and they're treated even worse and they're cycled in and out of our jail system when all they want to do is just be a mom or a dad. And I want them to have that ability. You shouldn't have to fight as hard as what I've had to and other parents have had to just to be a parent. We gotta get the court system out of the way and the adversarial system that it is currently. Um, and in doing so, I believe we're really gonna protect our families. We're going to protect our children and not the Illinois Bar Association. It's kind of a tough pivot, but uh, kind of wrapping things up, uh, how do you feel, what's your best pitch to the state of, uh, to the voters of the state of Illinois for, for why you should be governor? Number one, you owe Republicans and Democrats nothing. They have not served you and they have not served the state to the capacity that they've promised. So you owe them nothing. I have earned every single vote that I'm getting. I don't expect somebody's vote simply because I've got an R or a D or an L next to my name. It doesn't work like that. We have to stop voting against people and begin voting for people that we believe in them, we believe in their policies and what they stand for. And when we do that, we're going to see politics take a dramatic shift. And if you really want to hold Democrats and Republicans accountable, then do so with your vote. That is your voice. And if you vote for me in this election cycle, voters will send a very strong message to those two parties that they need to change their ways. And that's something that we can all benefit from.